Hello everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope everyone is doing great today. Uh, Scott Sugden here with L Acoustics. Uh, we're here today to talk all about sound vision, sound design solutions, specifically for the house of worship market. Um, for today, I've actually brought along a good friend and an expert in this whole uh, world of house of worship, specifically sound design, sound vision, and all things. Josh Mikeley, welcome, thanks for coming. Hey Scott, thanks for having me. Josh, you're uh, you're in Michigan, uh, central part of the United States. Uh, you're broadcasting from it. Looks like your kitchen there. Uh, yeah, a little uh, kitchenette behind me, but uh, yeah, as we're um, segregated here at home, um, this is uh, office central for me today. Excellent. And uh, I have with us as well BJ Shaver. BJ Shaver, business development manager for installs for U.S. and Canada. BJ, you're in Memphis, Tennessee, correct? Correct, Scott. <laughs> Hey, thanks, BJ. Thanks for coming with us. And last and definitely not least, uh, all the way from uh, uh, Germany, Martin Road. Martin, how are you today, Martin? I'm very good. Thanks a lot for having me as well. And um, I hope we have a good webinar. Thanks, Martin. So guys, uh, what we're going to do today is actually uh, let Josh show us um, uh, kind of his workflow and process specifically for House of Worship. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. Uh, if you have questions in German, please post them in the Q&A. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can. And uh, we're going to feed a bunch of those questions to Josh as well. Josh, uh, why don't you take it off and, and give us a, a little show? Awesome. Well, yeah, again, uh, welcome. So when we, uh, when we started looking at this, we decided that um, a good venue to display when we started talking about house of worship was probably um, a venue that looked somewhere between, let's say, um, 400 seats and 800 seats, because um, we felt like that was a really good representation of um, what size church uh, the majority of you guys are probably dealing with. Um, and the product that we were looking to utilize in this would be the A-series product, so whether that be A15 or A10. Um, but obviously, as we start to look at this venue here, um, we'll notice immediately that uh, it's quite wide. In fact, we have seating that kind of wraps all the way around the stage, which is more and more becoming the trend as we look at these uh, kind of satellite campuses, maybe for large churches, video venues, things like that. Um, and then there's the obvious issue of video, right? Um, all too often, we're seeing larger and larger and larger video screens that often are flanking the stage and in the center. Um, we have lighting positions that we also really need to be cognizant of um, as well. And so these are things that are really going to start to play into making sure that when we put the PA in the room, um, that we're avoiding those. And, and that's one of the unique things about Sound Vision for us is that um, we can build this room and add as much detail as, as we believe is necessary. Um, obviously, in this scenario, having video screens, having lighting positions, having um, our front of house position back here um, as well are very important things for us to be able to design the sound system around um, since they're things that are probably not moving. Um, so with that being said, um, there are a couple other criteria from this specific customer that we need to keep in mind as we move into the design phase and deciding how many speakers, where they're going, and so on and so forth. Um, one of those is uh, this customer um, has pretty stringent requirements in terms of um, SPL throughout the venue, especially for the spoken word. So they want wherever you're sitting in this venue for spoken word to be as similar as humanly possible. Um, we all know that there are certain limitations to this in terms of um, what is realistic in terms of SPL loss to the back of the room, et cetera. Um, and they initially, they really wanted the entire venue plus or minus uh, one dB at 1K. Now, um, that's going to be very hard to achieve in a large room, even in a room to this effect uh, or to this size. Um, that's still a challenge, right? We're talking, you know, 18 meters to uh, the back of the room from where the PA is going to be. Um, so very much within the wheelhouse of A series, A15 and A10. Um, but let's see what we can achieve um, looking at those kind of guidelines that they've given us. And so what I did is I, I went ahead and I placed a few loudspeakers um, ahead of time just to help speed up the workflow a little bit for us. Um, so we're going to go ahead and look at um, A15. And, and the deciding factor for A15 was really um, an SPL thing. Uh, the customer typically will run um, somewhere in the 95 to 98 dBA range. Um, so we're going to kind of keep that in the back of our mind as we, as we continue to design here. 
Um, and before we get too deep in this, one of the things you'll notice is I have a custom screen up right now. So this is one I've designed. Um, but what we can see is we have uh, a few different views that are kind of given to you in Sound Vision natively. And the first is the system and then the venue. Um, this view is going to let us see both what we're doing in terms of loudspeakers, um, and we can see our venue, and we can kind of see how that venue is broken down um, in terms of the floor, front of house, speaker locations that may have already been in there or been suggested by the integrator, um, walls, et cetera. Um, and so this is a great view, um, but when I'm doing primarily loudspeaker design, I tend to jump back and forth between the 2D source view, which is gonna show us our source cut view, um, the loudspeaker data again, our SPL target, and our frequency response. Um, this is a great window, but obviously we can't see what's happening in the 3D space as we're working within this. And so I went ahead and created a custom layout that I just named my name. Um, and this custom layout gives me my SPL target and my source cut view, but also my loudspeaker data. And this, this has been a really good window for me when I'm designing sound systems, whether that's also worship or anything else. Um, so we're gonna take a, go ahead and just take a um, top view a moment to see what, where we're putting PA. And you notice that um, the integrator has really specified for me where we had rigging points for the main speakers, where they would prefer them to be based on site rigging, et cetera. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and take that into account right now. Um, and so we dropped in a four box hang here um, of A15. And when we drop that in initially, um, all of our pan flex settings right now are set to the 110 degree. Um, you'll notice that we're all focuses. Um, and I went ahead and I put um, the A15 bump with the M bar um, in case we needed that extra bit of sight angle. Not every project and every sight angle is going to require an M bar. Um, but with a lot of down tilt, especially, that M bar is going to help us allow the PA to tilt down to where we would need it. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is go ahead and look at sight angle. Um, and if you look in my source cut view down to the bottom right of your screen, I'm going to zoom in a bit for you. Um, what you'll notice is, first of all, we're covering 81.8% of the audience uh, area that with that PA that it should be covering. Um, but obviously, we can do better than that. Um, so what we're going to do is go ahead and first just grab here, and we're going to drag this down to go ahead and set our sight angle. Now, we can see that front of house is set back here as a standing position, and right now I have the listening area set as a seated position. Um, so we want to go ahead and, and set this sight angle so that the top box, our D max, um, is right in kind of the middle of that front of house. This is a challenge, especially in this venue, because when we look back here, we'll see that that front of house is, of course, at the very back of the venue. We've never, ever seen that in a church, right? Um, but beyond that, it kind of extends back. But the front of house engineer is going to sit forward of this back wall. Um, so we're going to go ahead and set that sighting angle kind of right towards the front of front of house. Um, we're going to set a minimum. Um, and, and this is something that I personally do when I'm designing churches. Um, I want to make sure that the main PA covers to the front of the stage. Um, I'm not wanting to rely on front fills or, or center fills or any of those for coverage. So I want to make sure that my main PA is covering. So we've set our sight angle here. This seems quite realistic. Um, we've set kind of in the middle of the scene area, our D ref and our D ref is kind of, um, where let's see, say in an ideal world, maybe front of house would be, um, albeit, uh, it is not here. Um, and what we can very quickly see is that we don't have enough vertical coverage. Um, now there are a couple of things we could do here. Um, one would be add another focus box, um, but with A15 and A10, we have an option of doing a focus box, which has in this domain, 10 degrees vertical um, and 110 degrees wide, or I can go to a wide box very quickly, and now I have 30 degrees of vertical coverage in that domain. Um, and you can very quickly see here um, that we're now covering the entire audience listing area and just a bit in front of them, which is really good in this scenario. Um, so we've gone ahead and done that. And if we look over at our SPL target window here, you'll notice that I've set a target and this target is a pretty generic target. This is actually a target you're gonna get when you open Sound Vision for the first time and it's one dB of loss per 10 meters. Um, I have found this to be a really, really good um, reference for, for houses of worship especially. My threshold for pain tech, uh, typically is about four dB of loss to the back of the room in the largest venues. Um, but I'll be, I would like to see a little less, especially in a venue like this that isn't incredibly deep. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to optimize this, um, this array first. And so what we can do and what we can see here is if we go over to the electronics tab, um, we can choose first, how are we going to drive 
this system? Is it going to be driven with LA12X, LA4X, or LA8? Um, I'm going to go ahead and drive this for LA4X because I want to make sure that I have maximum resolution to be able to run for auto filter be, to be able to do its job. Um, and so what you'll see here is we, um, we can go ahead and say LA4X. We're going to do a maximum amount of cabinets um, per channel. Now, if I was on an LA12X, you'll notice that the maximum changes there, right? Um, we can do up to three boxes on an LA12X if we should want. But like I said, we're going to go ahead and use LA4X. Um, and we're going to make sure that our temperature and humidity settings are what we think this would be. Now, this venue um, that we're working on is actually going to be down in Florida. Um, and so if I click over here, um, I could click in this area or I could click on the um, options up at the top of the menu. And we'll see that we get the option here to change our temperature and humidity. Now, this temperature and humidity is going to tell auto filter what it needs to do in terms of what the site conditions will be. Um, so do the best you can to guess what it may be. Um, when you get on site, you can obviously take a measurement when you're on site of both temperature and humidity, um, and we could update that and then rerun auto filter based on the actual site settings. Um, given that this is in Florida, in the United States, um, I know that the room is probably going to be around 24 C, um, and I would expect the humidity to be quite high, but um, probably around a 50% range, 50 to 60% range. So we'll just go ahead and guess 24 C and 50% humidity. From there, I'm going to go ahead and run our auto filter. And it's going to say, do I want to use the current settings um, or the ones that I just updated? And I want to use the ones that I updated. Now, what you'll see here um, is we very quickly went ahead and updated. Um, and if I click on each individual box, we can very quickly see what auto filter has suggested. Now, what you'll all also notice here in the SVL target window um, is that we have immediately done really, really well here. Um, our target is now 95%. Um, within this. Now, there are certain things that we just can't control here, right? Um, I know that the fly height that we're utilizing here um, is actually the maximum fly height that I can get out of the PA in this scenario. And so that is the fly height that we're going to use. And so unfortunately, this bottom box is quite close to the people that are down here. There's only so much that we can do about some of that here. So you notice that we have a bit of SPL that's outside of what our, I guess, acceptable window would be. Um, and that's what's somewhat throwing our target off here, but you'll see all the way to the back of the venue, we're doing very well at staying within our target that we've set here. Um, also, you'll notice that the integrity, um, ultimately what I really try to shoot for is 90% above in both integrity and target. Um, but one of the things that we don't have a lot of control over when we're using something like A series, A15 or A10, um, is that integrity. Um, if I wanted a higher integrity, if I stayed with all focus boxes, or all wide, that integrity would, would go up a bit. Um, but because we are going from a 10 degree to a 30 degree, you're going to take a little bit of a hit in, in terms of integrity. But all in all, this is still a really good score, right? We're, very, we're quite close to 90% in integrity, and we're far north of 90% um, in our target. Um, hey, so what we can do, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, so I was just wondering, um, you're, you're showing off your design process here. Pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. You're showing off your design process here, um, how you work through the initial steps of this. Um, at what point do you kind of like stop yourself and go, okay, is is this four box A15 system going to be enough SPL? Do you get further along in the design process or after that initial concept you've started with four boxes of A15 covering this venue? Do you run like an analysis real quick to go, I'm going to hit that goal of 95 to 98 DBA or I want to have X amount of headroom. Uh, I would imagine as a house of worship, you guys are doing spoken word, you're doing live music, you're doing a lot of different things. Where in your process do you actually do that? Right, so typically in my process, that, that happens um, right after where we're at here. And so I would go ahead and symmetry this and we're just looking at mains right now, right? And that's gonna be a really good indicator of what the system, once we start adding fills, is going to do. Um, and so if we go ahead and symmetry that, um, you can see that we now have um, our left and our right mains. Um, and we can quite quickly here be able to tell um, that if I click in in the middle of the coverage area, um, we can see pretty quickly here that um, from 1 to 10K, we're at 103 dB SPL um, there in that area. And out towards the back, we're going to probably float in the 102 range, right? So only about a dB of difference there um, from what should be a pretty hot area to towards the back of the room. Now, um, that is kind of a max average. So that, that's an RMS um, number that we're going to get. Um, in the 1 to 10K range. 
Um, and so if I know that we're running at, let's say, um, 94 to 98 dBA, um, we're doing quite well already um, that our system is a bit overspecified for what we're running day to day. Um, but we want to keep in mind that we don't want to design a system that just by the skin of its teeth um, does what we need to do. We need to have some headroom so that we're running the system at maybe 70 or 8, you know, let's say 60, 70, 80 percent of its capacity um, on the usual case basis um, so that we, number one, have headroom to allow for good dynamics. Um, but also, if they should bring in an outside act or something where, or do a worship night where they want to have something a bit louder, um, they have the headroom to do that without driving the system um, into limit and utilizing its full abilities. Um, and so immediately I would look at that and say, well, if I had used A10, um, maybe that would not have gotten me the SPL here. You know, right now I'm seeing certain areas in the like 110 range um, in 1 to 10K. Um, and so I know at this point that I have enough headroom with the PA um, for the use case for this customer. Um, so we've gone ahead and I've looked at that. And if we look back at the top view, um, we can very quickly see um, from a 1 to 10K standpoint, what are we covering um, and what are we not, right? So as soon as we um, go into these, um, the non-filled in circles, we have to look at this area and being filled in. And if I map quite real quickly for you, um, 1 to 10K, so we can take a look at a step mode. And, and from a design perspective, I tend to use step mode quite a bit um, to help me very easily see where I have SPL falling off. So every one of these color changes is a 3 dB loss of SPL. Um, so if I want to main, maintain some amount of um, continuity in terms of SPL, obviously we're going to need to fill this area over here as well. Um, and so that would be kind of the next step for me is to say, okay, I've gotten my mains. Um, let's take a look at our fills. And what I did is I went ahead and just quickly dropped in um, a fill speaker here in the location that I know I can rig them. Um, and what we're looking at here um, is a four box hang of A10. Um, and if I kind of pan around, what you can see is um, we're there at that trim height that we were looking for. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put um, an A10 bump on there. Um, and um, what we can see is obviously we need to aim this. So one of the kind of pro tricks um, here is if we click on the X position here, we're gonna get a source position window. Um, and I'll expand this so it's a little easier for you guys to see. Um, what we can see in this is there is that A10 hang that we have. We have it at the correct trim height, but now we need to add some azimuth to it. And albeit we could guess, um, but it's a bit easier to just grab this and start aiming and covering where we need to cover, right? And so now if we go ahead and look again at the top view, what you can see is we've panned it out again. Um, but there are some things, there's some decisions we need to make here. Now you'll notice that we, we really have probably too much width and coverage. Um, if I was to mute the mains a moment, you'll see that we're covering quite far out into the area that we had the mains covering as well. Um, and so one of the unique abilities we have with um, A series, both A15 and A10, is we have the ability to do pan flex. Um, so first what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna utilize the pan flex in the top boxes. Um, and I'm going to take all of them actually and put them in 70 degree. You can immediately see, hey, this is matching up a lot better to what we saw from the coverage of the mains um, as far as that transition. And what we want to do is we want a really nice transition, but we don't want to have a ton of overlap. Hey, Josh, just to interrupt you, I want to, I think this is a great point to jump in here and to explain to people in SoundVision how easily we can see uh, the coverage even in impact mode. So if you're, if you're a kind of a beginner user of SoundVision, if you take a look, um, on Josh's screen here, these circles he's describing, these are actual real-time renders of the SPL 1 to 10K. So Josh can even show us that for each box uh, uh, or each part of the array. So what I actually see here is a horizontal view in this case with A10. And where that circle goes from filled to hollow, what that means is we're now 3 dB down in our coverage based on today's design. And when it disappears, that that's the uh, designed minus six points. So in other words, that's where the defined coverage of 70 degrees today is. Um, it's a really, really quick tool to go, okay, I'm 3 dB down on that array. I can look at the next one. And if it's 3 dB down, what's neat about 3 dB down from one array and 3 dB down from another array is when you're incoherent, i.e. not coupled, that pluses to zero, right? So minus three of a speaker in 
one part of the room and minus three from a speaker in another part of the room doing the same thing. When they're both minus three, we get zero dB. So right off the bat, Josh can super intuitively figure out, hey, if I minus three and minus three, these two arrays, when we walk the venue, it's going to be very, very similar SPL. And sound vision lets you see that really quickly, really intuitively with these circles in impact mode, which is kind of that that less resolution, but higher speed mode. And then we can switch back and forth the mapping. Sorry to interrupt you, Josh. Back no, to you. Yeah. Um, so what we can see here is we've kind of de determined uh, what an azimuth uh, possibly should be here. Um, but what you can notice very quickly, and this is something that I do quite often, um, is number one, you can see that we're not covering down to where we need to be covering, and we haven't really adjusted our sight angle. And so um, let's go ahead and aim our array down some um, so that we're starting to cover where we know we need to be covering, right? And you can see we're still missing an area down here. And so we're going to go ahead and make that bottom box a wide box as well. Um, but one of the other things that we can do is you can see that we're missing some areas over here. Um, and this is something that I do quite a bit. You'll notice that the bottom box right now is in 55-55. Now what I could do is I could pan that a bit away. Um, and so immediately you can see I went into 90 degrees asymmetric. Um, and you can see that we've now we have this really nice line still where we're trying to line up with the mains, but we've added some coverage over here. And I think on the next box, we're probably going to do the same thing. Um, there and there we go. So now we're starting to fill in this gap and then we're narrowing the PA to try to eliminate some of the reflections that we're going to have here on this wall. Um, we're going to do the same thing here with the um, A10s and we're going to go ahead and say that we want to do LA4X and we're going to do one box per channel. Now with an LA4X and A10 we could do up to two boxes per channel um, but for this customer they really like uh, the ability to be able to have the, the resolution there. Um, and we're going to run auto filter again in that scenario. And if we go back through this, you can kind of see the auto filter settings that auto filter is recommending in terms of the FIR plateaus that we have to play, use here. Now, what you'll notice very quickly is that both my house left and my house right, if I unmute or unhide that right now, are flashing red. Um, and this is a really good chance for me to show you what happens when this happens, because there may be a, a myriad of reasons that this is happening. But if we look up here, we see a warning. It says warning two. And if I click on that, it's house left A10 and house right A10. Um, so if I click on that, um, we're going to go ahead and get the mechanical view of the array. And if we scan down to the bottom, you'll see that it says sight angle impossible. Um, so this means that with this given bumper and all of the rigging points that we have on it, um, we're not going to be able to achieve the sight angle that we need. Luckily, there's a fix for this. Um, and that's going to be in what actual rigging are we utilizing here? So you can see that we need about a minus 15 degree or so sight. Um, so if I go ahead and I switch to an A10 rig bar with a pullback, that means that we now have a rig bar on the top and a pullback that will allow us to go ahead and get the sight angle that we need. Um, and so we'll go ahead and put in that minus 15 degree sight angle. And there we go. Now we no longer have a warning um, that, we, that we're possibly doing something wrong. Um, or something that would be potentially unsafe with the array or something that it just can't do. Um, so now if we go ahead and we unmute our mains again. So that's pretty cool, Josh. So what SoundVision was telling us is that it wasn't necessarily dangerous. It just was impossible to do with the rigging solution you had, right? Right. Right. So, so if we just try different rigging options in these situations, we might find a solution that works. Um, so that red flashing light doesn't always mean that the PA is going to break. It just means, hey, the bumper choice you have can't do that. Um, and this is this true for, I'm assuming, Kara and K1 and K2 and everything as well, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So all of the, all of the loudspeakers that L Acoustics um, uh, sells are in SoundVision. Um, and SoundVision is really your tool to know, um, is what I'm doing safe? Um, is it allowed? Um, is it possible, right? And so SoundVision is more than just um, a place to do sound design. Um, it also tells us what is safe and allowable in terms of loudspeaker deployment, um, which really makes it a very powerful tool. Um, you'll also notice um, that we went ahead and set that in and you'll notice that we're 99.5% on our target of what we want to do with the A10. So we've done really, really, really well there. Um, <clears throat> next thing that we're going to look at is, okay, we've got our mains in and we've and we've gone ahead and addressed coverage. And if we want to just take a look at how, how well we're doing, we can go ahead and map again here. And what you'll see is, all right, we're doing quite well in terms of our coverage and consistency here, but maybe we might want to take a little more angle out to try to get um, 
a bit more energy to these seats here so that we can kind of keep them within that 3 dB window that we were looking. Um, and so we could just manually go in here and enter an azimuth that we think might work. Um, and we can just keep adding a bit of azimuth until we're kind of happy with the outcome that we're getting there, right? I think that's a bit better. But um, there are a couple other things we need to deal with, right? There are um, some obvious um, things that we don't have in yet, and that's subwoofers. Um, but before we go down that road, I want to make sure that our sight lines are good, because one of the things that we mentioned um, was that we didn't want to get into the screens, right? And so there are a couple of ways we can do this. One of the ways that I do is sometimes I'll just pan all the way down to the listening area and take a look up um, and see, hey, um, is my PA dipping into the screens? Um, but there's another little way, and it's a, it's a little trick that a lot of us use, um, and we can actually just drop in a 5XT um, or an X4i, something, um, one of the coaxial speakers, let's say that we would want to. Um, we'll go back to our top view, and let's go ahead and move that all the way back here to the back corner of the room, maybe where it might be um, quite bad. Um, we'll spin it around so it's looking back at the stage, um, and we'll put it at our listening height of um, about 1.3 meters. Now, if I go and I go to that loudspeaker now, it should be sitting over here, and I show source and view, we now see this, and if I pan this over, um, what we can see now is we can see a really good idea of what would a person who's sitting at the back of the room be seeing in terms of the PA and the sight lines to the screens. You can see that we have really clear sight lines to all three screens. Um, so this tells me that we've done a really good job um, at picking our positions for our PA. Um, so I can go ahead and delete that if I want, or I could leave it in there and name it a camera, let's say. Um, but let's go ahead and add subs. Now, this is a conversation that um, can get very in depth, um, but with a series, we have a complementary subwoofer, and that subwoofer is KS21. Um, and so we really like um, a one-to-one -one ratio of subwoofers to mains when we're starting to talk about A15 or A10. Um, but often, especially in houses of worship, it's nice to have a mix, both um, some flown subs and some ground subs. Um, and for this customer, we're going to have a slightly higher sub count because they have a slightly higher contour that they like to deal with um, from time to time. Um, so the first we're going to look at is some flown subs. And so what I did is I went ahead and I dropped in um, some KS21s at the same position as the A15s. And you can see they've kind of jumped right in there and they're kind of overlapping. So the first thing we're going to do is go to our house right or house left KS21. They're, they're currently symmetried and you can see that by this kind of linked button here. Um, if something is symmetries and you don't want it linked, um, you could right click and unlink it if you wanted to. Um, but in this case, it's a symmetrical room. We're going to want those linked. And we're going to go ahead and move that back, let's say, a bit. And um, all right, that was a bit too far. Now, um, you could just click on the loudspeaker and drag it. And you see, as I do that, um, because they have a symmetry on them, they're going to move in conjunction. Um, and we're going to go ahead and place them right about there. So this way, from an installation standpoint, we have plenty of room to be able to fly the mains and fly the subs. And we're respecting the distance of um, let's say a meter and a half or less of the mains to the subs. Um, but visually, maybe the customer doesn't like this. So one of the other things we could do is we could add a similar sight angle to these. Um, so we had about a 15 degree down sight angle, so we could do the same with the subs um, if this was a preference for you visually. Um, so now you can see that we've gone ahead and dropped some subs in, a couple KS21s. Um, but as I mentioned, we're looking for a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so we're going to add some ground subs to help supplement that as well. Um, and I went ahead and dropped in, and as I mentioned, we're going a bit higher contour. So we have four KS28s that we're going to put under the deck here um, for the customer as well. Now I went ahead and for those ground subs, I dropped in a KS28. Um, I went with one enclosure tall and four wide, um, and we went ahead and we got that um, KS28 set up right there under the stage. But there are a few other areas that we need to deal with here. Um, one of them being lip fill or front fills. Um, this is one of the things that I think gets missed all too often in designs, both from a house of worship standpoint, but beyond that, performing arts centers, other things like that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I really want my main coverage 
from my mains to cover as close as possible to the stage. Um, so what are the front fills there for? Well, the front fills are there to help draw the image down because what you'll notice, especially if you're, let's say the pastor or parts of leadership who are sitting way up front here, um, the sound is going to be coming from above your head. And so we want to draw the image down. And so I'm utilizing front fills, not for coverage, but for imaging. Um, and so we, I went ahead and, and to save some time here, I dropped those front fills in and we're going to use X8s here because that's the preference of the customer. Uh, we could have used 5XTs as well. Um, they have plenty of horsepower to do what we need here. Um, but this customer really prefers X8s. Um, so we went ahead and we laid out some X8s. Now, um, how do we determine spacing of X8s is a, is a question I get asked quite a bit. Um, and you'll notice that as we have them sitting here, on the deck, they're below the listening area, unfortunately, right? If I mute everything except for our front fills, um, you'll see that we're not seeing those here mapped out. So one of the tricks you can use just so that you can see what's happening um, is we could go ahead and we could raise um, those guys up so we can actually grab our front fills and let's raise them up, um, let's say half a meter. Okay, and as soon as I raised them up half a meter, so I clicked on the group and raised it up half a meter, I took that back to zero, what you'll see is we can now see the coverage pattern from those speakers. And we could raise it up a bit more, um, but this is helping me make sure that I have consistent coverage from my front fills. Um, and I'm going to use kind of the same methodology of overlapping my minus three points to get really smooth, even coverage. Now, I have some limitations in this job because um, this is a mobile deck. Um, and there were some certain areas that they wanted them. Um, but this is a really good way to very quickly do that. Now, another thing you can do when you're doing this is you can utilize um, that source position that I showed you earlier to very quickly and easily lay these out. Um, and so we've dropped that exit in. And so this way I could click this and you can see as I drag that, it's going to move that and move both of them because I have them symmetry to really fine tune where I have them. This is a great trick, especially when you're starting to look at doing under balconies and things like that, where it can be a real challenge in the 3D space to place something under there. If you get the right height, then you can go to this source position, grab that loudspeaker and drag it out specifically where we want it. So we placed our front fills, we placed our mains. If I unmute all of those, we can see, all right, we're doing quite well. But one of the other things that I do a lot in my designs um, is I incorporate a center fill. And there's a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is you can see we have a bit of a gap in coverage. If we go back to just soloing out the mains and I map just one to 10K from them, you can see that we are 360 B down in the center. Now, this church will not utilize a center aisle. And so having those people be 60 B down, who's going to typically sit there? Well, a lot of times that's our lead pastor or some of the other leadership of the church. Um, but regardless of who it is, um, we want their experience to be similar as well. Um, additionally, when they're sitting there, even though we see a person speaking from the center of the stage, their attention is being drawn off to the left or the right PA. And that can be quite distracting in that area. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll throw in a center fill here. Let me go ahead and go out of mapping a moment. Um, and we will drop in a center fill here of an X12, um, and in this scenario, X12 is gonna provide the SPL we need, but you'll very quickly be able to see if it does or doesn't. Um, and if we go over to our source cut view here, we can click that here and we can drag down and we can get our sight angle of our X12. And we want that X12 there just to cover that area. And what that's gonna do is help draw our attention back to the center of stage, especially for these people sitting here in this middle section. If we unmute the entire PA again and look from the top view, and we go ahead and map, let's say, 1 to 10K again, um, what we can see, and um, we can see some white here, so maybe we want to change our scale a bit because we're getting a bit hot there, and so we can change our scale up a bit. Um, and we will take our front fills back down to their appropriate level. What we can see here is we're doing quite well in the step mode. If we look, if we click back to our options, we can go ahead and go to gradient mode. And this is much more of what we're going to hear. The step mode is really good um, for design purposes, um, but the gradient mode is going to show us more of what's happening. Now, all of these kind of streaks and lines 
are going to be the Gumbling because obviously we have a left right VA. We have multiple sources, and there is interaction between those multiple sources. Um, but this is a one to ten can be like. Now, one of the other things, if we jump up into the three D scene here, um, just below the three D scene, is we can actually map um, broadband SVL for unweighted, A weighted, or C weighted. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the A weighted mapping of the room looks like. And you can see here we're doing quite well. Um, we have we have very little variance in terms of coverage. You can see everything's pretty much orange with a little bit of red. Um, and a little bit of SPL build in the middle of the room isn't so bad. There is obviously some stereo summation that's going to happen here between the left and the right PA. Um, and we're going to have a bit more low frequency here. So it's probably a good thing that the PA is slightly hotter here than it is out here so that it tracks with how the subwoofer or, or the low frequency is also going to propagate in the room. So we've done all of this. One of the other things that I'm, I am um, quite stringent on is making sure that I name things, right? And so if you look over here in my sources, you'll notice that first of all, um, I've grouped things here. And so I have my main left, right, and we've named them um, house right, house left, outfills, all of this, because there's another thing that we can do and we can take a look at what is the delay criteria or how much are we going to need to put, how much time are we going to need to put on, let's say, um, this outfill compared to the mains. Um, and so um, one of the first things we need to be able to do is we need to define what is our criteria for what is acceptable here. Um, and let's say that we're going to say 6 dB and 6 milliseconds is our criteria for what we, we believe is going to be acceptable in terms of um, delay. And we're going to go ahead and go to our delay mode. And that's right here. We're going to switch delay mode on. Now, this can look a bit chaotic, but we need to look at individual sources at a time. And so we're going to mute everybody. And we're going to go ahead and unmute our house left A15. And we will unmute our house left A10 out. Now, immediately, um, you can see here that blue means that we are in single source mode. That means that anywhere in this blue area, you're going to localize to this single source of A15. Um, the same happens over here that we're going to localize to this single source of the A10. But what you'll notice is this yellow area is our common source, meaning that both of these arrays are contributing to the auditory event that's happening here based on their current level and their current timing. Um, what we will notice quite quickly, though, um, is that we don't need very much delay here, in fact. Um, and if I was to throw this drastically out of time, so let's say we were to put 20 milliseconds of time on this, what you can see now is um, that these sources are unaligned, right? We've put 20 milliseconds of time on the A10, and very quickly we can see they are unaligned here. So we could even set our criteria a bit stronger, and we could say, um, let's say, 3 dB and 3 milliseconds. So that's pretty and cool, Josh, right? So like let's let's see if i can spin this for for everyone who doesn't quite get this in sound vision you can hear or i guess see right uh, uh what it'll be like for the user experience in this delay mode and blue which is single source mode means i only hear one thing within a defined spl and time window um so that would be what you have at 3 db right now so uh, yeah, if we're db. sitting in yeah, if we're sitting in front, we don't hear the side hang. It's down at least 3 dB. We could set that to 6 or 10 or anything you'd like. Um, and where you see yellow, that means I hear two speakers. So I hear the, say, the main speaker and the side. Let's turn my hand here. There we go. How about that? Um, the main and the side speaker, and they're almost the same level. So one is, say, 99 and one is, say, 98. But if it's red, they're coming in at a different time. So I'm going to actually hear, like, two snare hits if they're off by too much, right? Right. Um, or the vocal is going to kind of blur because of that time shift. Um, so what this means is in sound vision in advance, you can find out if your placement choices are really good or really bad or somewhere in between helping uh, explain this to designers, helping to explain this to the lighting guys or video guys or the staff or the integrator, why this delay position will be good or bad, correct? Right. Yeah. And and this also can save us some time on site. So if you're the person who's doing the design and then we're transferring this onto the site um, and you're going to be the person doing, let's say, the calibration of the sound system there, um, we can start to do all of this delay here, um, which saves us a drastic amount of time on site. And to be quite honest with you, um, and we get into this in some of our training courses, um, but measuring just one small moment in time only gives you what's happening in terms of delay um, there. 
where in sound vision here, we can look at how this is affecting the entire listening plane. And so you can see pretty clearly here right now that we have a bit of a timing issue here. Um, so that's cool. So what, what you're saying is like when I do my delays on site, um, normally what I see is one mic position, right? So I can make it optimal in one spot. And if I look at your sound vision now, I see that actually what we have is what 500 different microphones. Each one of those dot represents a mic. So we're doing time alignment with 500 microphones at one time and we can try different options to see what works really well or what doesn't work well. Now, how accurate do you find it like when you go to on site versus sound vision, assuming that it's installed like it's supposed to be? Do you find a huge difference or is it pretty reasonable? So I found this to be very, very accurate. And obviously, it's got just touch on that. Um, how accurate the site is to the design is going to really dictate this. So one of the first things I do is obviously verify that the site conditions, fly heights, all of these things, positions match my sound vision. If they don't, I go ahead and update my sound vision. Um, but once we get that, what you'll notice is, is as you go through and measure along this plane or in any of these, um, you're going to be plus or minus probably a millisecond or so, um, which is a variance that we would expect. Um, and so if I was to look at this A10 hang here, um, I'm going to apply a bit of delay, right? Let's try maybe two milliseconds and we'll see, whoa, all right, that threw that quite out of time. Um, maybe that's not where I need my delay in this scenario. So I'll go to the house left A15 and maybe that's where we need the time. Um, yeah, and in fact, it was. Now, one of the ways that I could tell that easier is if I go back to zero time and I click here, what you'll notice is, is that this shows us the highest SPL. So at that position, um, the highest SPL is the house left A15, which we would expect. Um, but um, in terms of alignment, you'll see that we actually need um, at that position about 3.7 milliseconds on the A15 to align to the A10 there. Um, so what we can do is we could enter that value here, 3.7, um, and see what that does. All right, that does really well. And then we can continue to click here and see how well are we going to do. Now, this would be no different than placing a microphone there. I would expect if I put a microphone right where my pointer is right now, um, that um, if I was using Smart or our platform M1, that's probably going to suggest I need to put 0.11 less milliseconds of time on the A15. Um, but obviously that dynamically changes where our position is. So what we're trying to do is average what is best for the listening area as a whole. And we've done a really, really good job of that here. So actually, if we take and we now open up um, the other A-series stuff, um, what we don't want to do here is open all of these up, right? Because we're looking at time from one loudspeaker to another. But what we can do is we can go ahead and look at that center fill now. So if we go ahead and mute our A-series and we look at the center fill, um, we can apply the same time. Now you'll see pretty quickly, we have a timing problem here, right? Um, but we want to define where we're listening in, in this area. And so it looks like we're going to have to apply some time to the X12. But if we click in here, um, it looks like we need to apply about four milliseconds to the X12. Um, so we're going to jump on the X12, about four. Um, and now in the overall coverage between the A15 and the X12, you can see that we are in a common source mode. Um, and so um, the same would apply to the other side if we were to unmute this and unmute this. Um, that's going to apply there because those settings, because the left and the right are linked, are going to track between both of them, which is really a huge time saver and a really great advantage of what we can do here in SoundVision as well. So with all of that said, we've now we've pretty much covered all of our bases. Um, we've covered um, timing, we've covered um, mains placement, subs placement, front fills, uh, all of that. Um, so some of the other things we may want to look at is um, what's happening on stage in terms of energy, right? Because we've talked a lot about what's happening in the audience, um, but stage does matter. It matters um, in terms of our game before feedback when we start to talk about um, lavalier microphones or headset microphones or something to that effect. Um, and so if we go out of delay mode here and we go ahead and just unmute our entire PA um, and we go ahead and take a look from the top, what we can do is we can right click on this surface, which is a stage, and we can enable that in mapping mode now, um, which, is, which is quite nice. Um, and if we go back to our custom bandwidth, which was 1 to 10K, um, and we map that, what we can see here is obviously um, there's quite a bit of rejection. In fact, if we click out in the audience right now, um, our selected bandwidth of 1 to 10K, um, it, we're at 110.87 here, just almost 111 dB. Um, but from A-weighted, we're at a, almost 109 dBA. If we go on stage here, maybe where pastor would stand to preach typically. Oops, sorry. 
and we click, you can see that we're at 98. So we have greater than 10 dB. We're greater than 10 dB rejection from 1 to 10K from the house to the stage, which is really good, right? That means that if in the house, um, you started to feed back at about 80 dBA, that means you could get to 90 dBA with the pastor on the stage. Um, so we're doing pretty well. Um, but what are some of the other problem frequencies? Well, um, let's say that problem frequencies in a headset mic might be in the um, 200 to 600 hertz range. So what we can do is we can go back into our options menu here and go to calculation and we can change the bandwidth for that custom bandwidth that we're looking at. Um, so let's say we want to go from um, 250 hertz to 630 hertz and see how is this different from in the house to on stage. And again, if I click out here, I can see that um, within my selected bandwidth, I'm 115 out in the audience and here on stage, um, we're at 103. So we're about 12 dB of um, rejection there in this frequency range. Um, so we're, we're doing really well in terms of um, SPL in the house versus SPL on stage, kind of broadband. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. Cause like one thing I think people tend to forget is game before feedback, there's two important values to consider, right? Value number one is differential, right? How much energy in the house versus how much energy on stage. And the second thing is stability. So if you have great rejection at 2K, but at 150 or 200 Hertz, you have no rejection, that's really problematic. And it's even worse if you have like kind of splintering rejection. So you think of each frequency is doing great, then bad, then great, then bad. That's really hard to manage. Uh, as a mixer, because if the pastor moves, if the singer moves just a little bit, you can have a completely different gain before feedback scenario. So what we want to see is that that really wide stability and cancellation on stage is a really good indicator that you're going to have a good day. Um, so that looks quite good, especially from such a small array as what is at 4015 is just over a meter high, a meter and a half high, I think. That's really right. quite impressive. Yeah. So um, and, and, and that's one of the things that I find with our products. Um, quite often is that I, I struggle less with game before feedback because we do a really good job of managing um, what's happening on axis with our PAs, but also, also what's happening off axis and it's very stable, which means once I get that microphone stable on stage, wherever pastor tends to walk, I don't have to keep chasing frequencies because we've done a really good job of managing what those speakers do on axis and off axis. Great, um, Josh, we got a couple of questions that have been coming in. Uh, obviously one is like, how do you analyze tonal balance in the scenario? Are there maybe tools you can use to look at what the HF versus the LF is doing across the venue? Um, is there a quick, easy way? Is there a complex, uh, hard way to do it? Um, what's your preference? Um, so there is a complex hard way. The complex hard way would be to um, go ahead and take each one of those frequency bands or, or areas we wanna look at and map them individually and then try to use memory to remember what was what or make notes. Um, but we have an easier way for you to do that. And that's kind of in this SPL target window here. Um, so if we look at the SPL target window right now, um, what we're looking at is one to 10K. And that's a really good place when you're designing to be um, because it's what I would consider to be perceivable coverage um, in the one to 10K range. Um, and it's also something that we have a lot of control over when we start talking about pan flex and things like that. Um, but as Scott mentioned, um, we may want to look at what some of the other, other frequency bands are doing throughout the venue. And so we can actually define that here. So we can take a look and say, all right, what is 200 hertz to 600 hertz also doing, right? Um, so we can kind of see, and now in a small venue like this with a low trim height, um, there are only, there's only so much we do have control over here. Um, but what we'll see is, um, here is what this, this frequency band is doing. Um, we could look at something a bit more narrow, right? And so we could look at what is 250 hertz to let's say 400 hertz doing in the venue or a broader stroke of going um, to 2K, right? We can look at 250 hertz to 2K and see how that's tracking um, with what the one to 10K range is doing as well. And so that helps us make some decisions to go, hey, um, do I have way more low frequency at the back of the room um, than I maybe need? Um, or are we seeing way too much build to the front of the stage? Um, so this is a really quick, easy way to kind of compare your different bandwidths um, and look at that on axis with the PA. And we can do that for all of the PA. So we can look at the same thing here. If we click on the A10, um, we can look at what's happening out there um, from say 300 Hertz to 2K um, and compare that to the one to the 10K here as well. Cool. Yeah, Josh, another question that came in was your preference, especially dealing with house of worship, mono stereo fills, where you put what, where I, I um, like, do you have any, what's your feeling on that? You know, um, a lot of times this is driven or dictated by the end user or the customer, 
Um, they say we absolutely want a stereo rig or we want this. But we have to kind of step back and say what is important right now because if spoken word is absolutely positively the absolute most important thing in the world for this trip and worship, let's say, is maybe second or third in the pecking order there, maybe we want to look at a strictly mono PA. Um, so if this church had come to me and said, hey, Josh, um, spoken word, preaching is what we want to be absolute positively the best, worship kind of takes a subset from there, we don't need stereo, um, mono would probably be the better choice and maybe looking at, let's say, three hangs of A15. Um, but in this scenario, um, they really wanted to be able to use the stereo coverage to kind of work with effects. I mean, we all understand that um, where is pastor going to be? He's going to be pan center, which means essentially he is mono. Um, where is the worship leader, acoustic guitar, kick drum, all pan? They're all going to be pan centers, so they're essentially mono. But this church really wanted to be able to utilize the stereo coverage to spread out some of their effects and things like that. Um, and so we've tried to maximize the stereo coverage that we could, and then we're filling here. Now, um, one of the unique things that I'll do a lot of times in this scenario is I will actually pan this. And so this will be left, right, left, right. Um, or I'm sorry, right, left, right, left. Um, that serves a couple purposes. One, um, especially for these people here, they are they are in a in a mode where they're getting an experience from both of the PAs, um, and so they get a little bit of a sense of of that stereo panning that maybe they're doing with their effects. Um, but it also helps that if I should take a tom and pan it hard left, um, I don't get all kinds of summation on just one side of the room from that tom there, um, and it helps things be a bit more balanced and even in the room. Um, you know, one of my favorite one of my favorite statements always is whenever someone talks about you know uh, overlapping two systems is one person's comb filter is another person's stereo image, right? right. So um, you know it, it, I can I can tell you there's no comb filter in the PA it's all stereo image, um, and you can tell me it's all uh, stereo image or there's no comb filter or vice versa. Uh, so in this scenario, obviously having for instance the two main PAs and having a lot of stereo overlap, the things that are mono, i.e. the voices. Uh, maybe the lead guitar is going to come from multiple places. That's going to create a comb filter. But the things that are pan stereo is going to be a really nice experience for a lot of people. Um, and that's a, a balancer choice as a designer we get to make. Um, Josh, I'm going to ask you to see if you can drive something for me. We had a couple people question and ask. Um, we might have gone a little quick through that explanation of the filled circles versus the hollow and how that ends up being in minus 3 dB versus minus 6 dB and how that adds back up. So sure. I'll start explaining if you want to you want to prep that real quick on your end. Absolutely. So. Um, Remember, if we take two speakers in a room, right, and we couple them, so think a subwoofer, right? We take two subwoofers, we couple them, we get plus 6 dB because they're working together in energy, in time, in phase, right? They're working together really well. As soon as you separate them, there's only one tiny little spot where they're perfectly aligned. So everywhere else in the room, they're not aligned. There's something not quite perfect happening. And as soon as you do that, the average energy gain is 3 dB. So our energy gain is only 3 dB there. So SoundVision has an intuitive quick tool where you can have some filled circles, Right, and you can have some hollow circles, and having the two of those, you can see where the speaker system is starting to go from minus three, right? So that, that transition from fill to hollow is where we're three dB down in coverage. So that means in the center there, if Josh clicked on a speaker circle right in the very middle of the array, um, like right on axis, which should be the loudest, I would imagine. Yep. Probably so. I can't read the number, my screen's too small here. It's uh, uh, one thread. 110. So if he goes to like the first one of the hollowed circles, I would expect it to be about 107 or so. 107. Hey, that's magic. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so now I'm 3 dB down, and if I take my side hang and we look at where that same transition happens, right? Um, the expectation is, let's see, side hang, da, da, da. There's great. Side hang. Um, we see the exact same thing. So if we do that same center off axis behavior, exactly the same again. So center of one of those lines is going to be something like on a, almost 109. Great, and hollow is going to be 108 probably, or sorry, 106. Yep. Great, and so if we turn both of those on at the same time, if we have that transition happening about where that 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 filled the hollow is, what that says is both of them are down 3 dB. Um, so what I would expect is when we turn it on and we go to mapping, we should actually see, let's see, 106 plus 10, what was it, 108, uh, yep. something like that. So we should see something about 110. If I do my math right in my head, 110 and a half probably. Um, if we clicked in that, right off that in there, so in the middle there you got, so we're um, A-weighted like number 107. If we go to the scene here, we're 108 A-weighted. If we go back into the on-axis here, we're back to the 106, 107 range. Yeah, there you go. Right, so so two minus three dB sources incoherent, i.e. separated, not coupled. And remember, a separated, non-coupled speaker is anything that's uh, uh, not a subwoofer that's more than a 
few cent tens of centimeters apart um, is going to incoherently add on average across the room, which gives you plus 3 dB of each of them, right? So if they're both at 100, 100 plus 100 incoherent is 103. Um, and that's how we get to that scenario. So it's a really quick, easy way, fast to do that. Um, but of course, we have the overlapping sources. So you're going to hear two of them at the same time. So you have to timeline it much better, much better there. But that's a really good tool to really quickly and help you with that. Um, I think there was another question, uh, challenges with auto filter specifically, like what do you do when it's overshooting? Because auto filter, of course, takes different action when it hits an audience and it doesn't hit an audience. Are there any things you need to worry or be concerned about in that scenario? Um, there are. So, so a lot of times um, I may overshoot and that's that's not an uncommon thing, um, especially here. If we were to look at just this main box um, and let me mute everybody again and just unmute the main. Um, what we can see is, for instance, if right now um, I am in the coverage of front of house, but let's just say that this was a bit wider um, and I wasn't covering front of house there. So say we were out in five meters and what you'll notice is here that we are majorly, you know, seemingly overshooting here right now um, because we needed to be able to cover front house. And so one of the tricks I'll use is I will pan this a slight bit so that I'm covering the area that I need to be covering, right? Um, and then from there, that will give us the ability to run the auto filter, um, the area that we need to cover, and then we can move it back out. So that's one of the tick. Um, tricks that I use, especially when we have a very complex room geometry. For instance, if a room kind of points all the way to the rear and we need to be able to cover back there, but it, it starts, um, you know, having a gradient or, or kind of an angle out like that, um, that way auto filter can do its job for the farthest listening area, um, but um, we'll, pay, we'll move the array back to its final position still. Yeah, that's great. So uh, auto filter is actually looking at the, 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 impact to the audience, right? So it's bias is all about audience. So technique, like Josh said, you can move it just, in this case, we move it over half a meter to just get it to hit an audience section. Um, we could have also made front of house wider, even though it's fake. Um, we also could have, say, put a fake surface back there. And this this actual same thing uh, comes into account a lot of times when you see us uh, draw these really complex venues or shapes and we have aisles or areas that are non-seated. Um, a great example I think of is doing a design for, say, a, a big stadium. There might be a a large section of the, the turf that doesn't have an audience on it, you need to just have a fake surface there for auto filter to correctly take that into account. Um, pretty easy to do. Um, to make an audience listening level, all you have to do is just set a surface and give it an audience listening level. That, that would be all you'd have to do. Um, so Josh could even take that back wall and just give it the slightest bit of elevation on that back wall. Um, and that would that would activate that as an audience surface, which would then allow auto filter to calculate based on that scenario. Um, so it's a pretty simple and easy thing to do. Um, Let's see, what other questions have we gotten so far? I just saw one, how do you take into account reflections from walls? Um, I can answer that real quick. So sound vision is modeling direct sound only, right? So sound vision is modeling direct sound only. And why is that? Um, modeling reflections from walls requires you to specify what the wall is made of, okay? Um, it requires you to specify uh, what all the walls are made of, the absorption coefficients. It's quite a complex thing. Um, and there are really great tools in the market that do that already so you can actually take your sound vision design um, and you can open it up into those kind of tools via uh, some plugins uh, to get and understand based on that scenario what we can do however is take a look and go how much energy is actually hitting that back wall and infer some results so i could go i can see that i'm putting a lot of energy on this back wall and that might be problematic we would know that if if uh, uh, it was a big stone wall for instance versus a, a soft wall that might have some absorption on it um, in this scenario, in a house of worship, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, this is, reminds me so much of professional theater, musical theater, where uh, you get a lot of complaints and often the complaints come via the ushers. In other words, the ushers are complaining because they're standing in the back. Um, so I tend to want to make sure the PA hits up that wall a little bit, even if it's reflective, knowing that there's going to be a certain subset of people standing in the very back, listening to the service, listening to the performance. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, those are the people who are at both services or all three services or however many you do. Um, so the people who have a pretty good sense of that. Um, and also it, that data or, the, or knowing this is, is information that we've handed to the acoustician to help them understand that, hey, we are going to have to cover up this back wall to be able to cover front of house well from the mains. Um, so please be cognizant of that as you do the acoustical design for the room as well. Great. Um, so I'm seeing a few more questions come in here. Uh, BJ, did you have any uh, to field and send us as well at this point? Um, throwing you on the spot here, BJ. 
Hope you're ready. Uh, no worries. Uh, yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, great overview. It seems like uh, um, uh, you've got a church that's covering you pretty much just find all of the audience plane um, and you've got the subs in there and uh, you know a lot of churches are looking for that um, you know that that passion conference impact um, and you've got subs in there. Is there a advantage to subs behind versus beside? Um, and then I'll I'll ask some more questions. So the the subs above are, are the subs above behind or to the side. Um, yeah. A lot of times has to do with either aesthetic, um, our trim height limitations. Obviously, in this scenario, if I was to put those subs above the A15 because they are mechanically compatible, um, we would end up with a rig with an array because this is our max height that we would end up with that bottom box dipping very deep into the screens, which obviously wasn't going to be acceptable. Um, and having them off to the side visually limited some certain lighting positions and things. And so we ended up putting them behind. Um, so we kind of have, and in every one of our products, so whether that be Cara, whether that be um, A15, um, if you read the manual for them, it's gonna specify um, kind of the, the region that we can have the subs in. And so whether they're above, beside, or behind, we can get similar behavior um, out of them by doing that. Um, one of the advantages that having phone subs and ground subs gives us um, is that um, and and I, um, I will steal Scott Sugden's um, analogy here because he's the king of analogies. Um, but we look at subwoofers like, um, like a fat kid jumping in a pool. And, um, and ultimately, um, the best way that we could do this is if we had one single subwoofer in the middle of the room, that would be the most homogeneous output um, for us. Um, but the stark reality is that one subwoofer isn't going to give us enough SPL that we need or enough power here in this scenario. Um, and so um, what is the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is when two fat kids jump in the pool because the collision of the waves that are created at one point are being quite epic. And we've all heard that from a standard left-right sub-deployment on the ground. And so mixing the flown and the ground subs means that we're helping fill in where, where maybe there's a major collision from the flown left-right subs, the ground subs are going to fill that in a bit. And so that mixture of the two of them helps the low frequency be significantly more consistent throughout the room. Yeah, that's Thank a great you. point, Josh. Um, I think uh, uh, there's a million and one questions about subwoofers, and I hope over the next couple of weeks uh, we can maybe start answering some more of those for you guys. Um, Josh's analogy is my favorite one. Thank you, Josh, for stealing it. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's a really simple way to think of it. Uh, I also slightly resemble the fat kid jumping in the pool at times. Um, so uh, it's, 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 uh, it's both a great and shameful thing for me to think about. Um, so that's really good. I think, BJ, you had another question as well, if I recall, or it sure seemed like it. Yeah, from a from an integration standpoint, um, I'm always looking at cost because you know customers looking at cost. Uh, is there anything to save in terms of? I know that there's different rigging hardware for A15 and the subs. I know that you have different options for mini array of subs, like up to four, and then some bumpers can do up to 16. Um, there's I think the price differential may be upwards of 50% uh, between the two. Um, right. Can we look at that and what's um, what we can do with rigging? terms of cost yeah, or we, we can. So, so obviously in terms of cost there are a couple options um shipping soon here is the install series of the a of the a series boxes so a15i um ks21i and a10i um so there's some notable cost savings there as well um and some aesthetic things we can do um but from a rigging standpoint um one of the things we could do here both for um the subwoofer and for the a15 and you'll notice that because we needed the side angle over here with the a10 we used the rig bar um, typically when we're integrating, um, we need a point to hang the PA, but we also need a point to be able to steer the PA if we're doing a single point. Um, and so in that scenario, if we use the same thing we're doing over here with the A10, with the A15, and we did a rig bar with a pullback, that gives you the two points, the one to hang and the one, um, and then the pullback gives you the steer point. But also, um, that rig bar setup is about, I believe, about half the cost of what um, this rigging, the A15 bump and the M bar is. And we could utilize the same thing with the KS21. Um, so there are options, and those are things that we can play with. And, e and we can even look at that here, right? So if I was to take the um, A15, and we were about we're 10 degrees down, if I was to take that and make that a rig bar with a pullback, um, we could then put it at that minus 10. And boom, that rigging solution is, is notably cheaper. We can do the same thing here over the subs. Um, but what you'll notice is, um, if we were to utilize that scenario with the rig bar, we're not going to be able to get that angle, that down angle. So aesthetically, maybe that isn't appropriate for you, or maybe it is. 
Um, there's really no disadvantage to doing it this way. Uh, and we've reduced the cost of the rigging quite significantly here. Well, thank you, Josh. Um, so my last question is is maybe uh, one that a few of you have asked. Um, like uh, when you've done the whole design, is there a quick, easy way to find like the max total energy and like what maybe your weakest link is? And if so, what's your concern in terms of the weakest link? Um, so there is, you know, um, I try to take an, a, an approach to designing my systems to make sure that all of my systems are capable of the same SPL um, for their designated coverage area. Meaning um, here, the A10 was capable of doing the SPL I needed it to in the area it needed to cover, and it matched the SPL in that area to what the A15 was doing. Um, obviously, I could have added gain or, or um, turned up the A10, but the reality is, is that if we were to then push the system very hard, the A10 would enter limit prior to the A15. And so when we're going through and designing, I can even look at that in impact mode because of these color steps. Um, when we're looking at these color steps of these 3db color steps, if I unmute the mains, you can see that everything is in that orange um, and yellow range. If I was to unmute my outfills here, and let's just for for the sake of this, um, I'm going to turn those down um, by 6db. What you'll notice now is that those are green and yellow, and this is orange and yellow. So very quickly here, I can see, hey, this product isn't going to cut it for me out here. It's not enough SPL. I need to put a product that needs approximately 6 dB more output there. Um, so maybe that means that those outfills in that scenario needed to be A15 as well. Um, but luckily here, A10 does the job and it matches that very, very well. Um, so in so television, Josh, like I think we can see it on your screen here. I'll go back to that in a second. Um, what what we have the ability to do is see the headroom based on a certain kind of stimulus, right? So. Um, what we're assuming in sound vision is that you're sending uh, like a standard pink noise um, at a certain level and then we're calculating the return on that or we're calculating how much the speaker is going to make based on that pink noise level. Um, and you, what's neat about it is you can actually see the headroom if you want to select that and show people in the low frequency component and the high frequency component, right? Um, and that's based on your auto filter settings or EQ settings. And you can even see a box for box in the array with auto filter as well. You can see the headroom for the lows, the headroom for the highs. And if you were to change an EQ, for instance, if you were to array morph up or down something, you're going to affect the amount of headroom available in the lows or the highs specifically for any given speaker in the system. And all of that can be displayed then and calculated to the maximum level uh, capable for the system until the first thing hits limit. Um, and, and how do we, or where's that? That's a system config, I think, right? So if we hit system yep. config, um, we have fine max gain and that'll actually turn the, the console or the mixing board up until you run out of gas. So it's interesting, a lot of people don't really realize this right away. A sound vision by default doesn't show you the maximum capability of the speaker. It shows you you mixing at zero dBU from the mixing board. And then that means on our presets and our amplifiers at zero dBU from the mixing board, we have eight dB of headroom until we hit the limiter. Um, and that's showing you now zero dBU RMS or the continuous level from the mixing board with eight dB of headroom as we use equalization, as we do gain adjustments, um, we're gonna start to use up some of that headroom differentially across the system. Um, and when we're all done, we can hit find max gain. And what did it give you for a total usable gain value today? I can't read that, uh, Josh. 5.4 today. So 5.4. So we can mix to plus 5.4 dBU on our board with pink noise. And when that happens, we will then trigger the first limiter to engage. Um, and the first limiter, we can even go back to system kick and fig and see what has the least amount of headroom. And as long as it's not a huge difference between anything, we should be okay. Right. So cool. Um, that's great. BJ, did you have any more questions for us today? You guys that have any more questions? South. Cool, that's it from the south. Uh, Martin, how about uh, over in Germany? Do we have any uh, questions coming in from our German-speaking audience? Um, only a few people joining in from Germany, as far as I can see it, or they remain on speaking English. Um, we have uh, at least three questions in the Q&A. If you would have a look for Scott, um, that might be worth to, uh, to answer. For example, um, Jeff is asking if there is a cheat sheet for some of the shortcuts that you utilize in sound vision. Sure. So this is something so that's a, that's that... A, yeah, great. So um, there is, Josh is going to be a, a friend here and show us there's a help menu 
Um, this is this has actually been updated quite a lot recently, and I don't know if everyone's familiar with the help menu here, but it opens a web browser, which is really cool. And in the web browser, you can quickly dynamically search through different topics. But what's really neat is there's a tutorial section as well. I want to highlight this every single day. So those of you who have never seen this before, up on the top there, Josh, in the middle, it says tutorials. Um, it's so new, in fact, uh, not all of us are even aware. And the tutorials actually show video content. So it's like Network Manager has little help video tutorials. Um, and you can actually go through and see a little video on how to do stuff. There aren't a huge number of keyboard shortcuts, but there is a document in there to show you some of the different keyboard shortcuts and how to do it. Um, so I definitely say, hey, if you're new to Sound Vision, you're not sure what you can or can't do, go through and just check this out. It's also a great thing to do every time we update Sound Vision, um, just to go in there and find out what's new. It's a really quick way to go, oh, they added this feature, they added this thing, so on and so forth. So please definitely check it out. It's really well put together by our documents team over at uh, El Acoustics and, and Marco C. Um, and don't hesitate. Martin, you got uh, another good question coming in, I think? Yes, um, it was asked on a regular basis how we handle delays on the subs, and uh, therefore it, it might be worse to underline that we are not doing some kind of uh, a face trace alignment in sound vision. So what you should do is uh, do it on site with the measurement system. Otherwise, as an alternative, uh, you can refer to the preset preset guide PDF that we are releasing in our drive systems release on a regular basis and you will find free alignment delay values that you need to use if both loudspeakers are exactly on the same position, for example, case 21 and A15. And then you have to calculate that with the pass length difference that you are going to measure on site. So this would be an alternative how to use it uh, when you are not uh, a proud owner of a of a measurement system on site, and if you are not familiar with 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 measuring, that's that's perfect. Uh, that's a perfect answer, Martin. I think um, so. In Sound Vision, right, you can calculate the 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 challenges and delay in terms of perception SPL. Um, it gets quite complex to challenge to to measure mains and subs in there, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but first and foremost, especially if you have like subs on the ground next to a wall. Um, the actual acoustic arrival is affected by the reflection from the wall, and so you need to have a modeling software that takes that into account in order to get a correct result. So generally speaking, everything in the live production space side of things, um, all the software tools don't take into account those direct reflections very well or at all. Um, so when you get on site, you'll find a number that's different. Um, if you guys already have a P1 and you've checked out M1 in beta, you can see how that works. It's quite easy to do, but we generally find we get really good results in that scenario. So that's a great question, Martin. Um, and then I hope it's a topic we're going to get to over the next couple of weeks as we all uh, uh, stay uh, hunkered down to challenge and uh, uh, learn ourselves over the next couple of weeks. Did you have uh, one last question coming in, I think, Martin, as well? Yes, uh, Anonymous is asking, what if your front of house is upstairs and not on the main floor? How would a program like this take that account making sure coverage is accurate, both balcony and main floor. So this is something that could be probably asked by, by Josh as the um, main design. Yeah, so um, it's not uncommon, especially in the house of worship, sometimes to have people who need to mix um, from a crow's nest or a balcony or something. Um, and so we're going to address um, design there no differently than we would down here, only we may have to have a delay system. And so in some scenarios, um, maybe the main PA can cover the balcony and the ground. Um, but let's say um, this mix position was just elevated up here and it was the only thing um, covering that area. Um, I can show you very quickly if we want to do that. Um, and if I was to take front of house and elevate it for us, um, let's say to um, three meters. Right. Um, so now we have this um, this area up here. Um, obviously, it, it, here it would not be a good idea to cover this um, this front of house location from here. Um, so maybe we should look at a couple of X8s. Um, so we could uh, go ahead and add a coaxial box here and add an X8. Um, we will go ahead and, and um, orient it in the horizontal. And um, let's say uh, we already know we've elevated that up a bit. So maybe we need to be somewhere around six or seven meters. Um, <clears throat> And then we can grab that loudspeaker and use it to cover this area. Um, now, one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure again that we have a similar um, SPL here than we do to down on the floor. Um, and you'll notice that it's red, it's in limit because we're overloading it based on our console headroom. Um, so we'll we'll adjust for that. And very quickly, I can see well 
the the X8 probably isn't going to provide um, the same amount of SPL as I'm getting from everything on the floor. So maybe this should be something different. So I could copy that position um, and let's look at an X12 in that position. Um, so we'll go here, we'll put an X12 in um, and we'll paste that position. And there we go, We've, we now see that. And if we pan it down, you can see, okay, now we have a bit more um, headroom um, out of this and it's much more similar to what we were getting from the main speakers. We could symmetry this. Um, and now we can see that we're covering that um, mixed position with a stereo coverage um, from some X12s that'll give us similar um, headroom and response to what we're getting down here. Now, um, from an actual calibration standpoint, one of the things that I tend to do um, is calibrate my main PA and everything down here, and then take a measurement um, from, a, from somewhere down on the floor, let's say mid house, and take a capture of what the frequency response and SPL magnitude is there. And then I'm gonna try to match that up in the balcony um, with the main PA on. Um, and so that helps me um, to the best of our abilities match what's happening down on the floor to what we're doing up in the balcony. Cool, thank you, Josh. Um, well, everyone, I really wanna say thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I really hope you guys have had a good uh, good time. You've learned a few things. Um, you've learned a few tips or tricks as well. Um, please don't hesitate to keep joining us. Don't hesitate to reach out to us on social media to share the post about these different webinars we're doing. Um, we hope to be able to keep continuing to doing these and help you guys grow your skills over the next couple of weeks while we all get ready to get back to work doing live events around the world and installations. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you, BJ. Thank you, Josh. Um, join us tomorrow if you'd like, same time. So please join us tomorrow, same time. It's going to be myself, Tony Zabo, uh, and Tim McCall talking all about festival sound design. And we've got a bunch of great questions to answer already. Um, we're going to show off some different festival challenges specifically and how when we start getting big, uh, what, the, what the real ramifications are of that. Um, so please don't hesitate to join us. If you have questions, feel free to post them online on our Facebook in advance. We'll see if we can answer those directly uh, or in the presentation. Um, Josh, Fantastic job as always. Uh, I hope Thank all is well in Michigan. I hope you're being safe and healthy. I hope your family's well. Same to everyone out there. Please uh, have a great uh, rest of your day and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye guys. Take care.